Hafede Guam, Aloha Hawaii, Kia ora Aotearoa New Zealand and welcome islands and island supporters everywhere. I am so excited to have the honor to introduce one of the world's leading advocates to end the use of fossil fuels, Hank Rogers. And I'm wearing my 1.5 degree pin in his honor. Hank is just about my hero. He is a visionary and he's a solutionary. And when I arrived in Hawaii in 2016, having helped negotiate the UN Sustainable Development Goals and thinking about the Paris Climate Accords, I was pretty depressed. I really didn't see how we were going to get where we needed to get. And then I learned about Hawaii's 100% renewable energy commitment by 2045. And I learned about who was behind it. So thank you, Hank Rogers, for making such a huge impact. Hank is the founder and chair of the board of Blue Planet Foundation, the founder and the CEO of Blue Planet Energy, the founder and the president of Blue Planet Research, and also now the founder of the Blue Planet Alliance. He's going to tell you a lot more about all of that. But Hank, we can't tell you how thrilled we are to have you as keynote speaker. This is my second Island Wisdom for a Global Future Conference, and I'm delighted to be back as your biggest fan on the planet. I am so thrilled to have the honor to introduce you here today, Mr. Hank Rogers. <clears throat> Hi, um, my name is Hank Rogers, as Amanda. Thank you, Amanda, for such a great introduction. Oh my gosh, I hope I live up to it. Uh, a little bit about my background. I was born in the Netherlands, that's Holland to some of you. Uh, moved to New York City when I was 11, moved to Hawaii when I was 18. You can imagine moving from the city, meaning concrete and asphalt, to the beach in Hawaii uh, when you're 18 years old and learning how to surf and how to dive. You can imagine what big, how huge of a change that was. I fell in love with the ocean. I fell in love with everything about it, the coral, the fish, the surf, I mean, you name it. What, what isn't there to love? I followed up a year on the beach uh, with um, uh, University of Hawaii. I, um, my major was computer science and my minor was Dungeons and Dragons. I don't know how many of you out there can, uh, can know what role playing games are. But uh, after my stint at the University of Hawaii, I chased a girl to Japan and six years later, personal computers came out and I wrote the first role playing game in Japan, which is probably the most difficult thing I've ever done in my life. What it did for me is it not only gave me a game that I could publish, but it gave me a publishing, publishing company that I could use to publish other games. So what did I publish? Well, I wrote the first couple of games and then I started traveling around the world looking for games to bring to Japan. One of those games I found at the Consumer Electronics Show, it was called Tetris, of course. Um, so I published Tetris in Japan and Game Boy came out and I went to the Soviet Union to get the Game Boy rights. Um, <clears throat> so that's my, basically my career up until something changed my life. Well, what changed my life? Uh, first of all, what changed my life is I sold a company. I sold a company for enough money so that my wife said that I didn't have to work anymore. And theoretically, I don't have to work anymore. Unfortunately, I'm working harder today than I've ever worked. Um, a month after I sold my company, I found myself in the back of an ambulance on the way to a hospital. What was going on? I had a hundred percent blockage of the widow maker. And what does that mean? It means that if you don't get to a hospital within so many minutes, you die. And so <laughs> I, um, I'm lying in the back of the ambulance and I'm thinking, what are you talking about? I haven't spent any of the money yet. That was the first thing I thought. And then the second thing I, th I thought is, no, I'm not going, I still have stuff to do. And so in the recovery room, I decided that I was gonna find my missions in life because obviously under, under the conditions that I was about to die, saying that I still have stuff to do, what did I mean by that? Well, I have four children, they were already out of college and they already had jobs, so they didn't need any more, me anymore and my wife, we already made enough money, so she didn't need me anymore. So here I am. What do I mean by I still have stuff to do? And so I decided to find my missions life in life, and I did. 
my first mission came to me in the back of the newspaper while I was still in the recovery room. And it was, oh, by the way, we're going to kill all the coral in the world by the end of the century. And I'm thinking, you idiots, that's imp that you can't do that. We can't do that. What's causing that? It's carbon dioxide being absorbed into the ocean, uh, causing um, ocean acidification. And ocean acidification is, is what happens when uh, the coral dissolves faster than the coral can make coral. So basically, we're talking about losing all the coral in the world. So I said, okay, we have to, what's causing the carbon dioxide? And it's um, basically, it's man-made internal combustion of, of oil, coal, and gas. These are all fossil fuels. And so I, I asked them, uh, I'm thinking that the mission must be to end the use of carbon-based fuel. So how do I go about doing that? Well, I decided that I was going to start a foundation that's working to, to end the use of carbon-based fuel. And the, that foundation is called the Blue Planet Foundation. Rather than me telling you what the Blue Planet Foundation does, I'm going to ask my seven-year-old niece, Mia, to tell you what the Blue Planet Foundation does. Can you guys play the video? Hawaii is our home. But our home is changing. Breaking news on Kauai tonight. Devastating flooding. Widespread damage. Homes on the verge of collapsing. The world is changing. The largest wildfires in the state of California. Tonight, the rain is over, but the disaster is not. I worry sometimes when I think about my future. What will it be like when I grow up? Would it be like what my parents remember? Climate change scares me. But we know that it doesn't have to be this way. We can change. That's why I'm grateful for Blue Planet Foundation. For the past 10 years, Blue Planet has been leading the way for clean energy. They think if we can do it in Hawaii, we can show the entire world what a clean energy future looks like. They brought together hundreds of students just like me to be a part of the change. Join their families and neighbors to draw the line on climate change. Our voices really matter, and us being here today is showing something and showcasing to the world that we really care about this issue and we want to take a stand. And in 2015, their efforts paid off when Hawaii passed our country's first 100% renewable energy. It's nice to know when I grow up, all our energy will come from clean sources. And now Blue Planet is growing. The Repower Project is working to bring Hawaii's 100% renewable energy law to other states. Now Blue Planet is active every day, making this change happen. They are in our classrooms and in our communities. We still have a long way to go. We have a lot of work to do. I'm excited about the new future we are creating. We can help solve our climate crisis, starting in Hawaii, and we'll inspire the world. But we can't do it alone. Will you help? For my future. So the first thing I did was I, I formed the foundation and I went and talked to the, um, uh, the governor of Hawaii at the time, Linda Lingle. And I said, you know what? Uh, what I really want to do is I want to... Um, uh, told her my plan that I was going to uh, end the use of carbon-based fuel in Hawaii. And she said to me, you really don't know what you're talking about, do you? And I said, well, 
I may not know what I'm talking about now, but I will know what I'm talking about uh, when I get going. And uh, so how did we go about doing all the things that we did? And we did a whole bunch of things. And the, the answer is that we tried everything. And then we, we would try a bunch of things and we would see what worked and what didn't work. And we would do more of what worked and, what, and, and stop doing what didn't work. Uh, to get the people on our side, the first thing we did is we empowered uh, elementary school children to, um, by giving them 300,000 light bulbs to go door to door and exchange those light bulbs, thereby starting a conversation between a child and an adult about what the energy future should be and why, why light bulbs are such an important part of it. Turns out you can save 90% of your, uh, your lighting electricity by switching to light bulbs, I mean to uh, LED light bulbs. <clears throat> the second thing we did was a project called the Blue Line Project because you know, people don't have, a, don't have a, a concept of what's actually going on with sea level rise. Uh, they think, well, it's not really going to affect them and, and so on and so forth. So we had junior high school uh, students draw on sidewalks with blue uh, chalk where high tide would be in a one meter rise in sea level. And we got the news out. We got the governor to come out. We got a lot of people. We got a lot of fanfare. And at the end of that, at, at the end of that exercise, pretty much everybody in Hawaii knew that Waikiki and a lot of Honolulu was going to be underwater in a one meter rise in sea level, which is the minimum rise in sea level, level predicted by the IPCC. The third thing we did is, is we, we tried to help the people on the outer islands. And I guess this is a, a problem in, in most islands. These people had very old refrigerators, uh, energy inefficient. And of course, if you buy a new refrigerator, an energy saver refrigerator, you will save a lot of money on the electricity. So we made a deal with General Electric and we brought in container loads of refrigerators at cost and exchanged them for existing, you know, it was, it was minor, a minor cost. I mean, people would be able to pay for the cost of the refrigerator in, in electricity savings in about a year. So who wouldn't uh, want that deal? So we got the people on our side. And then we, do, we started doing what we do best, which is we create legislation and we lobby. We create le legislation and we lobby. We do a lot of it. And so we've created all kinds of, uh, of uh, how can I say, bills. Some of them got through, some of them didn't get through. And I'll get into a list of, of the ones that got through or partial list anyway. The other thing that we did is we interviewed in, in the Public Utilities Commission, the PUC. So when the electric company says, I wanna do blah, we say, uh, wait a minute, the people probably don't need you to do blah. You know, like the PUC approves all rate, hi uh, rate hikes or new projects that the electric company wants to do. Or in fact, the PUC does a bunch of different things besides uh, just energy, but we're uh, energy focused. Our focus is 100% renewable energy. So we, um, one of the things that we did was we uh, created a barrel tax. Uh, for, every for every barrel of oil that's imported in Hawaii, uh, there's a dollar tax added to it, and that dollar goes to food security and renewable energy. Well, it used to anyway, until we got into financial trouble. Now it's in the general fund. We'll have to go and fight for it again. But our biggest uh, success, of course, was the 100% mandate. And we, asked, we were asking for 100% by 2040. Uh, the IPCC always talks about 2050, so our legislator says, we'll give you 100% by 2050, and we negotiated and negotiated and negotiated and finally we managed to get it through 100% by 2045. Now, 100, uh, 2045, what's the big deal about 2045? Well, it turns out my son told me, hey, you know what, Dad, this is the 100th anniversary of the United Nations. Wow, what better success story for the world than for us all to have solved climate change by the 100th anniversary of the United Nations? So you can't just pass a mandate and expect everything to just fall into place. You have to follow it up by other actions. And so one of the actions was we, we created something called community solar. Uh, community solar works this way. If you don't have a roof that, that where the sun shines, like if you're li living in a building or if you're in the shadow of a mountain, then community solar allows you to put your solar panels 
somewhere else on somebody else's roof. So there could be a field with solar panels that belong to people that don't live there. And that way they can get the benefit of having renewable energy and solar energy without having it on their roof because they can't for, for whatever reason. Um, so we, the other thing is that we, the, the big deal <laughs> is we changed the business model of the electric company. The electric company traditionally makes 10% on top of the price of oil. When we change that business model to they get to make more money the quicker they change to renewables. And guess what that happened? What happens after we did that? Oh, gee. The last year, the electric company came up with an RFP, a request for proposal for 800 megawatts of renewable energy. That's pretty much half of Hawaii. So first you have the mandate, then you have the people who are actually in the business of generating that energy work on and figure out how to do it. And then you let them get on with it because they're the ones who know how to do it. I'm not, we don't tell the electric company you have to do this. We just tell them that it's gotta be done by 2045. And guess what? Not months after we passed the mandate, the electric company came out and said, you know what? We actually looked at it and we figured out we can actually do it by 2040. Right on electric company. So what else did we do? Or what else do we do? We have, um, we have a yearly student energy summit. It's a two day gathering where 200 students from all of the islands get together and discuss how we can achieve uh, renewable energy uh, in Hawaii and maybe in the world. <clears throat> the other thing that we do is we have, uh, uh, we train car salespeople because when, when I started, it was first all about the utility and electricity. And then I asked my guys, how, how, how effective have we been? Have we reduced the amount of oil that we import in, into Hawaii? And they sheepishly said, no, actually it's flat. And I said, what do you mean it's flat? We have reduced the amount of electricity that people use. Yeah, but in that same time, the oil price went down a bit and people started buying SUVs and driving them. And so whatever we saved in electricity was made up by, by internal combustion cars. And I'm, we're going, oh my gosh, we have to do something about ground traffic. In, in, in Hawaii, we spend $4 billion, $5 billion a year on oil. 40%, sorry, 30% goes to jet fuel, 30% goes to ground transportation, and 30% goes to, 40% goes to electricity. So the ground transportation is 30%. So the answer to that is electric vehicles. Hello. So we're training uh, car sales because every car company now has an electric car coming down the pipe. We, um, created as a program called Repower. And what Repower does is it helps other states do what we did in Hawaii, which is to achieve a mandate of 100% renewable energy by 2045 or whatever date they can get away with. New York State actually got, it, got a mandate of 2040. California copied us and, and they're 2045. And thank you very much, Guam. You have been our latest success in that you have achieved a mandate of 100% by 2045. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, what I do. Um, I have a ranch on the Big Island, and it's called Pu'u Va'a Va'a Ranch. And Pu'u, va, pu'u means hill, Va'a Va'a means canoe. I think this is where they used to get the, the wood to make the canoes to, to go back to Tahiti or wherever they came from. Um, my ranch, it's about 28 acres. It's an island. It's an island of 28 acres surrounded by 100,000 acres of conservation land. And to find out what sustainability looks like, the first thing we did was let's make us energy independent. And so what we did was uh, we created the energy lab. You can see the energy lab here. Um, but the energy lab is next, yeah, the energy lab is a research facility where we study sustainability. So the first thing we did was we took the ranch off grid. We spent about a year uh, working with vanadium redox flow batteries and they were a disaster. Uh, at the end of the year, uh, they didn't work anymore and we had to get rid of them. Actually, they're still here. We still have that chemistry, uh, evil chemistry at the ranch. But then we, I said, let's search for a chemistry that is um, benign. Because uh, 
I, I just don't like the idea of having poisonous chemicals at my ranch that might someday leak somehow. Uh, we narrowed it down in the end to um, lithium ferrous phosphate made by Sony and nickel cobalt manganese, which is still lithium, lithium nickel cobalt manganese made by Tesla. And my guys went to visit the uh, factory where they make the power wall and they went to visit the Sony factory in Japan. And they came back and they said, no, no question. The answer is lithium iron phosphate. And I said, why? The reason is, is because lithium iron phosphate does not get hot. So it doesn't need a cooling system. And the question goes, what happens when the nickel cobalt manganese batteries get too hot? They catch on fire. And this is not a fire that you can put out with a fire extinguisher or a, or a fire hose. This is the kind of fire that you, the, the uh, firefighters are told, don't go near it, just wait until it's done. It's like fireworks. And so, the, so if you've got uh, a power wall or, 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 or bigger battery that has the nickel cobalt manganese, you need to have a cooling system. And the cooling system is moving parts. And I think moving parts are the enemy of islands because islands have a very corrosive atmosphere. And so anything that you have that has moving parts will stop working. And I, I, I'd hate to see a battery installation stop working or catch on fire because the parts stop moving. So our batteries, the batteries that we chose for, um, for my ranch and then uh, my house in Honolulu uh, are lithium ferrous phosphate. And uh, so this is a view of my garage uh, in Honolulu. It's me standing by my uh, three banks of Blue Ion 1.0. Uh, you can see that it's, uh, it's Sony. It looks like stereo equipment. Uh, everything else on the right is inverters and charge controllers and things I don't even understand because it's electronics. Um, but that is 60 kilowatt hours and that is enough. I have, I have a fairly large home in Honolulu and that is enough to run the entire house day and night. Um, so what, what's, what did we do next? We, um, we made something, we, we, we tried to find out what else can we do that's bigger? And so we came up and designed something called, the, we call it the Blue, Blue Ion M class. And the Blue Ion M is a 20 foot container that contains a megawatt, that's a thousand kilowatts, a megawatt of batteries. This particular battery bank will be used to, um, to provide power to our well. Our well goes down 2,400 feet. That's like 800 meters. That's where the water is. And, it, and, it, and we, we pull the water up and it uh, serves a community of about 120 homes. So it's not just our, my ranch, but it's a nearby community of 120 homes. So this is a pretty big installation. So now we're showing you that you can pump water. Again, we have a field of, of, uh, of solar panels that charge the batteries and then the batteries run the pump. And then um, basically now you have a water system that doesn't require grid electricity. Um, lastly, if, we, if you're off grid and we, we found this out, <laughs> you have to build your system so that it's big enough so it'll work on a cloudy day. And so what happens on a sunny day? On a cloudy day, you get barely enough to, to charge the battery to 100%. On a sunny day, by mid-morning, you have already completely charged your batteries. And basically at that point, you're throwing energy away because the panels are still generating, but you have no use for it. So, this is not only a problem for us at the ranch, but it's a problem for islands. If we were to take islands off grid and um, create a situation where they're 100% renewable by solar, then you have times of day when you have extra energy. What do you do with it? Well, we decided to make hydrogen with that excess energy. And hydrogen is not only a backup fuel, which means that when you have multiple cloudy days and you don't have enough light or sunlight to charge your batteries, you can use the hydrogen, you can turn it back into electricity and charge the batteries using something called a fuel cell. On the left side of this picture is an electrolyzer and we are capable, if we were to run the electro, electrolyzer full time to make 12 kilos of hydrogen per day. And on the right side, you see our hydrogen fueling station, which is waiting for a hydrogen vehicle uh, so not only do we, can we use it as a backup fuel for the ranch, but we can also use it as a transportation fuel. 
And that is the answer to, to uh, islands uh, transportation. Sedans, electric cars are fine because you don't need so much, they're not so heavy duty. But trucks and buses, electric is just not enough. It takes too long to charge. And so hydrogen trucks and buses are the way to go. So the future is 100% electric because a hydrogen car or hydrogen truck or bus is still an electric car and it doesn't require any fossil fuel. So you can use the excess uh, solar energy, the uh, renewable energy that you produce on your island to create hydrogen, which is then the transportation, transportation fuel. So what do we do at the, uh, at the energy lab? We try many things. People send us or ask us to test uh, something which, new, a new technology which, how can I say, they, they think it's gonna work, but they haven't tried it yet. Or they've tried it under laboratory condition, but they haven't tried it on, on a working condition. So it's basically our, a research lab where we get to try things. And one of the things that we tried, and this, this uh, came up after I went to Puerto Rico and found out that people, some people still didn't have electricity after like a year or more after the hurricane. So what's up with that? And, and the answer is, is that there's only so many trucks that can like put the wires back. And of course, the poor people on the, at the end of the line are going to be the last ones to get their electricity back. So during the emergency, what happened was people lost electricity, people lost the ability to communicate because their phones stopped working, their cell phones stopped working, and then they had a water problem. So uh, I decided, we decided that we should try to build something which could be used in an emergency. And we call it the cube. The cube is a, um, the cube, there, there's a picture of the cube deployed. The cube is an eight foot container that contains 32 panels. And basically the idea is that you could drop a cube in by truck or by helicopter uh, into a situation and then open the doors, take out the panels, and in three hours later, you have a little power station. So everything is contained in the container. We even included satellite dish so that we could have Wi-Fi. So to test the cube, we took it to Burning Man. Now, I don't know how many of you know what Burning Man is. It's a festival, and there's lots and lots of art exhibits at the festival, and we powered the largest art exhibit at, uh, at the Burning Man called the Folly. And this is, um, there were 400 light bulbs, there were lots of little stores, there was a courtyard on the inside, and basically, hey, this is like a village. This is a village. And we powered the village for, for seven days, day and night, using only our uh, cube with our power, uh, with our solar panels. So after working on, uh, um, taking my ranch off grid and taking my ho house off grid, other people started asking me, can you help me also go off grid or stay off grid? And so we said, sure. And so we ended up helping other people and that turned into a business. And so now we're uh, talking about a business that I started. You know, I guess I'm, a, I'm a, an entrepreneur, so everything ends up being a business at some point. Um, we have a company called Blue Planet Energy. And Blue Planet Energy took our first prototype of a 16, it's a competition for the power wall, a 16 kilowatt hour product called Blue Ion 2.0. 1.0 was in my garage, 2.0 is selling all over the place. We have actually, it's a, it's a very robust business. Um, we started in Hawaii thinking that Hawaii was our main market because we had the most expensive electricity in the country. But we soon found out that people on the mainland also needed to be off-grid or stay off-grid. So very quickly, our, our, uh, most of our customers, customers ended up being on the mainland. And then what happened is uh, the hurricane in, uh, in Puerto Rico happened. And after the hurricane, everybody started because the, the electric company not only didn't connect, but the electric, even if, if you were connected, the electricity went on and off. And so everybody has diesel generators, which are noisy, smelly, dangerous, and expensive. And so that became our next market. And then the Red Cross came. The Red Cross asked us to, um, to help them retrofit uh, 114 schools that failed as emergency shelters. Why did they fail? If you have an emergency shelter, a school that is supposed to work as an emergency shelter, and the power goes off, 
nothing happens at night. You can't feed people, you can't sleep people, you can't do anything. If you, there's, no, there's no light in the bathroom. So what we did uh, with the Red Cross is we put six Blue Ion 2.0s in each school, 114 schools, and, and the local solar uh, installers put solar panels on the roofs. There is, there is an example of solar on the roof and some of our batteries in the, in the basement of the school. Um, the Red Cross chose our batteries over all the other batteries because ours do not produce toxic fumes if there is a fire or they never catch on fire. So Red Cross is of course concerned with safety. Now, I'm a big fan of Tesla myself. I have four Tesla cars um, and, and I would have chosen Tesla, but in my house, I think safety is more important. So safety being the most important thing, I don't want to have a battery in my house that's ever going to catch on fire for any reason. And I don't need ludicrous mode in my house. It's great for my car. I can show it up to my friends, but in my house, I want safety. So where do we go from there? Our next product is, uh, is a more industrial product for larger installations. And I, uh, it's called Blue Planet. It's called Blue Ion LX. And Blue Ion LX, it's high voltage, it's 64 kilowatts. Actually, you're looking at two of them next to each other. That's probably 128 kilowatts. But basically, now we're able to do uh, grid scale storage because you can line these things up and have plenty of them. So where do we go from there? The last thing um, that, I, that I need to talk about is um, Blue Planet Alliance. And Blue Planet Alliance is the latest thing, as Amanda said, it's the latest thing that I'm involved in. Um, and I started thinking about how we, what we did in Hawaii in, in terms of the mandate and then how we helped other states and other territories uh, of the United States with the mandate. The problem is, that we're only 6% of the population of the world. And basically, it, to solve climate change, everybody has to change, not just us. And I'm not saying that we're any faster than any other country because we are not even in the Paris Accord right now, but we're doing it anyway, by the way. We're doing it anyway. So the, what the, the concept of the um, alliance was uh, to have other countries, and I would say starting with island states like yours, to have the mandate because you, the islands of the world, will be the most affected by climate change of any jurisdiction. So you need to, you need to be the most concerned about this. So it's two years ago and this beautiful woman from uh, New Zealand, uh, Amanda Ellis, comes to my office and brings with her the Secretary General of the Interparliamentary Union. I wasn't even there, but somehow I got invited to speak at their next uh, assembly. The Interparliamentary Union is a gathering of 187 countries. They meet twice a year, they have an assembly. Each country gets to speak for seven minutes. And uh, they gave me 15. I had no idea what I was getting into, but I, but I did my 15 minutes. After that, and I didn't know this was gonna happen, they get to declare a, an emergency. Every, every assembly, they get to declare an emergency. And the small island, island developing states, some of you are, some, are SIDS countries, uh, got together and they wanted climate change to be the emergency. And they tried before and failed a number of times, but this time climate change became the emergency. I felt, and they, they, they said, they thanked me for the speech because it flipped everybody, or so it felt. And I felt like, oh, I felt like Superman. The next day I was in a room with uh, 14 other countries working on drafting this, the, 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 uh, the wording. And uh, uh, somebody said, we must maintain leadership uh, on fighting climate change. And I, I said, I'm sorry, um, if you want to maintain leadership in something, you must first take leadership. And they changed the words. They changed all the words that I asked them to change. So the resolution turned out to be a really nice resolution. Well, I spoke at uh, that um, IPU uh, gathering. I spoke again in, in uh, COP24 uh, in Katowice, Katowice, and then uh, they asked me to come to Doha. Now they said, you won't be able to speak because you've already spoken twice. 
But guess what happened in Doha? The emergency was a, a cyclone in Mozambique. And so the cyclone in Mozambique being a climate change related event, they said, you got four minutes. And this is what I did with my four minutes. Next video, please. Well, on the Kalima, the Blue Planet Foundation, it's Roder, Roder. <laughs> My sincere condolences to the people who suffered the wrath of Mother Nature. This is unfortunately only the beginning, and we are still behaving as though nothing is really wrong. We know climate change is co caused by coal, oil, and gas, yet we continue to increase production. We know we are destroying the world our children will have to live in. How dare we do this? Are our differences so great that we cannot agree to save our children? Is our selfishness so great that we sacrifice the lives of our children so we can drive a nicer car or watch a bigger television? Cyclone Idai in Africa is not an extreme weather event. It is the new normal. If we don't ask, act decisively, the much more extreme storms of the future will make us wish for the extreme weather events of today. You parliamentarians are the chosen ones. Your people chose you to be their leader. So lead. The path to survival of our children is clear. We must stop producing more carbon dioxide than nature can absorb. We must change our way of life. We must use only renewable sources of energy. We must decide on a deadline by when we must complete this change. We must become 100% renewable by 2045. The bl we have formed an alliance to achieve this goal. The Blue Planet Alliance will achieve 100% renewable energy by 2045. You and your governments must pledge to achieve 100% renewable energy in your country by 2045. Your children are asking you to help them. Be leaders. To, do to join the Alliance, all you have to do is get your country to pledge to achieve 100% renewable energy by 2045. This is the greatest battle humankind has ever fought. We will be victorious. We must for our children. Thank you. So what should the Blue Planet Alliance do? And I started thinking about this um, in earnest and I traveled around the world to all kinds of conferences and, and, and met people and asked them, what should we do? And I, as many people as I met, um, that is how many uh, things to do that people came up with. Um, so we, but we did reach a consensus. And the consensus that we reached is the vision of the Blue Planet Alliance is that we should, uh, we should uh, create a world in which humanity and nature live in harmony. And in so doing, we, we include uh, garbage in the ocean. We include all, everything to do with sustainability. Um, so here we are. Um, it's now 2020, we're in the middle of a, a COVID pandemic. And for some reason, people have stopped traveling. And it's such a wonderful thing. Now we understand what uh, the future could look like. Because if we lived like this, and if we continue to live like this, I know of course we can't do it exactly this way, but if we just don't go back to the way things were before the pandemic, we will actually be able to achieve all of the things we need to achieve to fix climate change and everything else 
by 2045. So that is my goal, is to fix not only climate change, but everything else that's wrong with the planet. Every place where we're out of balance, we should be getting into balance, and we should learn how to live in harmony with nature. Thank you very much. Awesome, thank you so much, Hank. You're always an amazing inspiration. And as Dr. Christ pointed out, there's such a relationship between COVID and climate that we absolutely need to do what you have said and to be building back better and building back sustainably. You have done so much in terms of influencing policy change, you have youth at the table, and you're coming up with the technological solutions too. So I, given time is short, I'm just going to ask you to leave everybody with one thought. Lots of people in the chat room are asking, how can they join the Alliance? Could you let everybody know how they can become part of this movement? And we'll hand back to Lauren. So we are working on our website. Uh, we tried to get it done in time, but it turns out it takes more time. So please come and visit, visit us at blueplanetalliance.org. That's blueplanetalliance, one word, dot org. It should be ready in a couple of weeks. That's how you join. Or you can have a mandate for your country of 100% renewable energy, of course. I've just been told there's not time for questions from the chat room or from the respondents. We have some special things happening. So okay. just let everybody know that there will be a workshop uh, to help promote this mandate of 100% renewable energy for islands. And we've been talking in the chat room about that. And to thank you, just finishing with a quote from Lieutenant Governor Tenorio, who spoke last week and said, the most important thing we need to do is empower change agents. And you are just the most impactful change made agent I have met. So a huge thank you, mahalo, aloha, and uh, Godspeed. Keep doing this wonderful work. And handing back to Lauren now. <laughs>